No. All right, so time isn't money. The one is time. So next slide. Time is life. Isn't it? Yeah. It is. How could it not be? So if you learn to master your time, you will control your life. But you have to embrace the idea that I'm talking about with time. So, but instead of me standing up here, somebody who's not a professional speaker, um, I have a snippet from an interview. Uh, it's from a podcast called London Real. Uh, a gentleman named Eric Thomas. Um, wonderful, wonderful speaker. Let's listen. You might have to back it up. But... All you gotta do is. Or do you want me to? Can you hear it on here? I've got my, I've got this quote, I've got the podcast on my, I think that would be yeah. more useful. Let me, let me zoom right forward to the, uh, I'm not a tech guy, so I, uh, here we go. Here we go. All right, let's go. Yeah. Yeah. Let me try to put the mic on. Huh? Sorry, sorry about this. I shouldn't work hard and sometimes long hours. I encourage you to build a vision for your life and then and only then build a business to support that vision. Then work your ass off at executing your vision. The problem is most people spend more time planning a five-day vacation than they do the other 360 days in a year. Most people live without a filter for their daily decision making. So, just so we're clear, this literally means you need to have a written vision, and then you can build a business which can be operated in your free time. So, this leads me to the next topic. I call it the passion problem. Next slide. Uh, for some reason, that should have a uh, strike through the first quote, because it's another one that I don't like. If you love what you do for a living, you'll never work a day in your life. Sit well with me, so I, I, I change it. If you focus on life, then the relative importance of what you do for income is diminished. Next slide. So, what, what am I talking about? It's my opinion that attaching your heart and soul to a business transaction is much riskier than any financial commitment. Well, how could that be? It's because of average people. Next slide. Eric Thomas says. Average people live in a different world, one where nothing is important and there is no sense of urgency. I hate to tell you, but in the real estate business, you cannot avoid working with these people. Sure. 
You'll be forced to work with average people that do not respect your time. These people that do not have the same perspective and values as you. Your business transactions will not go as planned because of these necessary interactions with average people. So, the sooner you detach your self-worth from the results of your business transactions, the happier you'll be, and you'll be a better business person. Next slide. So I was listening to the radio one Saturday morning. I'm kind of a nerd, so I only listen to talk radio. And this was a wine talk show. They were talking about wine. I don't know anything about wine, but I, I don't know. It's kind of cool. And um, anyhow, there was a guy on there, and he was talking about his business as it relates to wine, et cetera, and how he's, you know, he doesn't work, he doesn't work unless he gets paid. And, blah. and he said, he said, you know, in my business, I'm a good person, but I'm not a nice guy. And I was like, wow. That, it just resonated with me because I had recently realized that you can't operate passionately in this business or it'll break your heart every day, right? You can't, you can't tie your heart to a business transaction. But, you, so how do I operate? If I can't do it passionately, well, I need to have that sort of ethos. So, that quote changed my life. In fact, the quote set me free in my, from a business perspective. When I heard this, I realized that I couldn't be responsible for what was going on in everyone else's life. I discovered that it was none of my business, and all I could do was the right thing that fits my best interest based on my written vision. Next slide. So, does that mean I'm gonna, in 30 years, I'm gonna be that guy? <laughs> that, that's not what I'm saying. He's that guy now. <laughs> Next slide. Should I operate my business like a gangster from a famous Hollywood film? No. What are you talking about? You need to do the right thing that fits your vision. So, it really is that simple. Um, I wanted to work through that. Obviously, it's not really the rehabbing, but in my opinion, it's more important. It's easier to convey in this atmosphere, this, uh, this environment. Um, but if there aren't any questions related to what I just spoke about, I'd like to move on. We can kind of talk through rehabbing, but I'm really looking forward to the Q&A when it comes to rehabbing. Okay. Um, we got ahead of ourselves here. Um, oh, the blank slide. Hmm. All right, I'm just going to read my read my paper then. Well, no, no. She thought you weren't ready. She can go back to it. Um, no, there's another. Okay. It's all good. It's all good. We'll work through it. All right. So that slide. Actually, I picked out a quote that I do like. Uh, Mr. Wonderful, Shark Tank. Anybody watch it? Yes. Sir. Yeah. 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 He yeah. was. There was a. There was a. a a lady up there, and she's trying to pitch him on these cupcakes. And, and he said, look, there's nothing proprietary about a cupcake. There's only executional excellence. And what he was trying to say is there's nothing unique that can be patented or held as a corporate secret that can't be reverse engineered. All you can do is run a great cupcake business. Rehab is the same way. So the other slide, in addition to that, it had some, some other things. It said, based on, and this goes back to something you talked about, but Based on your exhaustive research of the neighborhood, you've developed a scope of work that makes sense for the neighborhood in which you're rehabbing. Right, I'm laying out some assumptions here because we can't walk through all this in 15 minutes. Number two, you've taken note of what other good rehabbers are paying for similar property in that same neighborhood. And number three, you've enlisted the help of the general contractor. And then uh, my last note is, we're gonna kind of walk through the sequence on the rehab. It's a general kind of sequence. Many of these steps can intersect or happen concurrently. I always encourage people, especially new people, just do your best to make progress every day. And even if you might get ahead of yourself, keep moving forward. All right, next slide. Planning. All right, you're going to see where I, I have you earn your money here every now and then. Um, these are the steps where I feel like a rehabber really adds value. Um, by definition, you need to bring something to the table during the rehab process, or you are going to get cut out of the process. So focus on those slides, perhaps more than others. Um, when it comes to planning, I believe you earn your money here. Um, get permits. I always use an architect who has an engineer uh, that he can refer to as needed. I work with that architect directly, directly, I give him feedback and I provide a critique based on the drawings that he provides me. Um, that iterative back and forth produces a, a, a property that I'm happy to build. Um, and then 
just to make my point, did I mention permits? Did I mention permits? I am a firm believer in doing things the right way. Uh, in, some, in some cases, that makes me less competitive, but whatever, that's not how I run my business. Next slide. Demo. This also goes back to doing things the right way, and, um, and in my eyes, predictability. I want to start from scratch as much as I can. Um, for me, uh, knowing the future is the best thing in, in any investment, and when I can remove some of the variables, that helps me know the future. So the first spot to do that is in demo. Um, so that's why I tend to take out more rather than less. Waterproofing. A lot of people skip this step. You've probably heard it referred to as a French drain, drain tile, which by the way, there's no freaking tile. It's not anymore. It used to be a <laughs> tile, but there's no tile. You've probably piped in stone. It's an interior perimeter drain that I put in every one of my houses. You would really, really have to sell me hard on why I shouldn't do this, even if I'm not finishing a basement. Next slide. Masonry in the first frame. There's some masonry work that must be done while the walls are open, as well as constructing all the new structure in the interior of the building. Exterior framing may or may not be a priority at this point, and yes, you do earn your money here. At this point in time, you're going to want to be handy for your GC. You're going to want to be there because decisions will need to be made that really the general contractor is not paid to make. Um, the dimensions from your architect won't exactly match what's going on in the property, and you, you, know, you need a three foot for a hallway, so how does that affect the closet? Well, that affects the bathroom. That's how these things go. And if you, want to, if you want to make money in this business, you have to add value at some point, right? Otherwise, you're going to get cut out. Next slide. And along the way, you can work on the exterior building. This is a house I sold uh, two months ago. You can see how it looked when it started on the outside and then when I finished. Um, the exterior of the building, the good news is you can kind of work on it along the way. As long as it's watertight, um, you don't have to worry about getting a new job or anything like that. But, I try to knock it out early in the process. Uh, oftentimes, if I have a front porch type home like this, I will not finish my front porch until the end because the guys that are worked on my house will destroy it during the project. So, uh, in terms of parking, by the way, um, that's a, that's also exterior work. That's another another thing that will get destroyed. Brand new concrete, get paint, get this, get all this stuff on it. If you wait till later in the project, oftentimes you come out with a better product. Next slide. Trades, you earn your money here. Um, I believe getting the plumber and the HVAC guy together. Uh, with these, with, when you have these two guys on the job, one's running pipes, the other's running duct work, you need them working together to minimize the impact to your house because you have this beautiful design. And really, the challenge is well, how do I keep this beautiful design and still have air conditioning and plumbing and all the things that we expect to have in a modern house? Um, and keep in mind, we're not building these brand new, where we can't change the shell necessarily. So this is an extremely important part of the job. Um, the electrician can get started at this point as well, although the electrician really can't finish his job until you get through the next step, which is the second frame. Wow, I took a jump in the picture. Look at that. Anyhow, you have to add bulkheads and ugliness. You're really prepping your house for drywall. Um, this is another thing. A lot of people say, well, what's a second frame? My friend, I have a second frame. What? It's, the part of, it's part of the project that none of us want to do. None of us want to take headroom from the first floor of a nice new row home, but in some cases you have to. You earn your money here because you force your contractor to force your, I don't like that I said it that way. You act as quality control to make sure you're doing it the best way instead of the easiest way. Insulation. Most people don't know. There are other parts of the, the uh, project uh, that we've talked about that do require inspection. The only reason I mentioned that for insulation is that most people don't realize that insulation does require an inspection as well. Um, it's one of the few things that the county, Baltimore County, is more rigid on than Baltimore City. And the good news is uh, a company like Devere Insulation that specializes in insulating homes, they offer next day service. I use them on all my houses. They can show up and get it done. And they get it and they know the modern codes. They know not just modern, but updated to the minute. But what's being even so much as in some parts of the city they might not be enforcing something that they're enforcing in another part. 
and that sort of knowledge can just can really make the project run more smoothly. Thanks. All right, hard work is over at this point. Honestly, I, you haven't even put you haven't put tile, you haven't put anything in your house, but the work is done. The work is done. Move on. Drywall. If your drywall looks like a kindergartner's art project, you hire the wrong contractor. <laughs> you can't sand crappy finish work. That's a fact. Next step. All right, and I, I purposely lumped this together on one slide because a lot of people give all of this stuff way too much credit. You've done all this work. Really, the work is done. You've, you've put all this thought into it. Um, I mean, one second. I apologize. The rest of the job is literally a shiny facade that covers up all of the thoughtful work on which you and your contractor collaborated. Unfortunately, most buyers only see the prettiness. They don't appreciate the function until they've lived in the home. So if you enjoy this part, have fun with it. But no matter what, don't slow down. And I believe in putting a bow on it. Right? You're trying to sell this thing. It's like a gift. And you can't just stop like, oh, OK, fine. Project's done. I'm going to move on to the next one. I really believe um, that your painter should be the last one on the job. And once the painter has touched up, I recommend using a professional staging company to ensure that the property shows the way you want it to show. Highlight the highlights, draw attention away from the shortcomings. I believe in using a professional ph photographer. The, the, on the MLS, it'll look uh, exponentially better if you use a professional photographer. And then the agent that you choose to work with makes a lot of difference. Um, not only might they have the connections with buyers that are out there looking for houses, but when it comes time to negotiate, you want somebody with experience. So, <coughs> that. Oh, I have excited about that. <laughs> Thanks, Gordon. <clears throat> A quick announcement. Did anyone want to fill out any of these forms for Judy? If you have, can you pass them to the center of your row and then she'll pick them up? There's going to be a drawing yeah. for the book on um, the Banker's Code. And the brand new car. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that yet, but we'll, hopefully we'll get there. So thank you very much. Hey, our our um, third speaker tonight is Joseph Child. Um, Joe is the owner of Presto Management, and he has over 30 years, 10 year experience in uh, mortgage and, and real estate financing. And he has closed over a quarter billion dollars, billion with a B, in personal, um, personally closed funded transactions. So, Joe? First of all, I, I've sat back there. So, about this time of night, I know how tired you are. So, could everybody just stand up <laughs> and shake their arms a little bit and, you know. You move up front. I talk loud. I'm a little more uh, louder than I probably need to be. Um, thank you. Sit down. Enjoy. <laughs> Relax. <laughs> well, a wholesale to rehab. Show me the money. Um, you know, sometimes you uh, start at the end and you finish first. Um, First about me real quick, uh, 30 years in the business, I own Presto Management, I also work Washington Home Mortgage, I'm an NL NLS licensed loan officer. So just this past month, I have done deals in seven, eight, zero points, and I've also done deals at 14 and a half percent, five points. So it's a huge range out there, and you are going to fit somewhere in that range. Um, Notes tonight, don't worry about notes. If you would, just take out your cell phone if you don't already have it out. This summer, 90% of the adults in America own cell phones. That's the new medium. So if you open up your contacts right now, click the little plus sign under the name, type Joe says so, text. And my phone number is 443-336-7000. If you just save that, 
Just text me your questions tonight, text me your requests. If you include your email in that text, I'll put you on my uh, newsletter. I just do, a, I do it myself. It's just a friendly monthly, sometimes twice a month newsletter called Joe Says So. If you give me your email, I'll put you on that. And that's uh, the best way to reach me. That's fine. You're a one you know, I, you, you gave me that new newfangled thing. I should have just taken the picture because I'm stuck. <laughs> <laughs> we share the same phone. We're still trying to figure it out. <laughs> All right, five seconds. Four, three, two, done. Thank you, Glenn. Private equity lending, hard money, portfolio lending. Uh, <clears throat> there's some and important differences, but for our purposes tonight, we're going to kind of lump those all together. There's a lot of new people, so for those of you that are experienced, you've heard this before, maybe it's a refresher. For new people, this is going to be kind of the baseline. Uh, we're not talking about conventional bank, agency mortgage lending, what I use with my NMLS license, that's the FHA, VA, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. There's a reason that we're not talking about uh, agency financing tonight, consumer borrower end lending, and that is because consumer end lending has way more regulation than hard money and private equity. The rules are much stricter, there's licensing involved, disclosures involved, uh, red flag. If you're seeking private equity or hard money loans for self-funding a project, <coughs> that you're going to occupy, someone's going to get in trouble. And unfortunately, it probably won't be you. It'll probably be the lender. So stick to what you're doing. You're here tonight because we're talking about private equity lending. It's business to business, investors, multiple property LLCs, partnership lending. And the Baltimore Washington Investors Meetup, this group exists to further your property investment goals. This is a huge resource. In this room is your insurance policy and your protection. Talk to these people, get to know them. I'm relatively new to this group and I can't tell you how much resource is in this room. So if you're new, come back, please, and share what you have and learn. Yeah, I'm doing that. Okay, show me the money. You're at the point in the journey, you've got some seed money, some general knowledge, you may have talked to a wholesaler, you've talked to a, a rehab, renovator, contractor, um, and you're ready to press go. You're excited. You're jamming. Let's go. And there's actually, you know, there's You talk to a few private equity lenders, hard money lenders, and what do you see? Cue the shark music. <laughs> Here they come. What are you talking about? 14% and 5 points? Are you crazy? Well, there's a lot of lenders in the room, and every deal is different, but if you want to close in three days and you need a lender funding letter this afternoon, and the deal's kind of shaky, and the numbers aren't solid, but you still want to move forward, someone's going to say 14, 15 percent, 2, 3, 4, 5 points. And if that's what you need, you know what? That's okay. There's a, there's a way to work that in. Probably not where you want to start. So stop, relax, learn tonight, talk to your lenders, talk to your wholesalers, talk to your uh, the people that you're involved with on the deal. General rules for private equity investment, this is the baseline. Most private equity hard money lenders will lend on the performance and the numbers of the property and the market. There's less emphasis on the investor, the buyer, um, the borrower's credit, your day job income. They're really looking at the performance of the property. This is a business. You're, you're financing a business. So that's what they're looking at. Risk determines the caps that they will go to. So again, this is a baseline. 
And there's two important pieces. Your baseline numbers include the acquisition cost, which is the price plus renovation, and the after renovation value, the ARV, or if you're not renovating, the LTV, loan to value. So most lenders, most private equity lenders, will lend somewhere between 75 and 80% of acquisition price. 75 to 80% of that price plus renovation number. All right? Let's look at math. Yay, math example. You purchase the property for 125,000. Renovation costs are 75,000. So the acquisition cost is how much? 200,000. That's your acquisition cost. 80% of 200,000 is how much? 160,000 in proceeds from your loan. The math's easy. Whatever the lender says, it's 65, it's 75, it's 80. Some lenders go to 90. It, I hear you know lenders talk about going to 100% of acquisition. Um, Getting the purchase details and the, re the renovation costs, getting this part right is the heart of the deal. Because I'm just numbers. I'm looking at 75 to 80% of what they're saying. So you better be connected to some good wholesalers and you better be connected to some good renovators and some people that know what they're talking about. That's what protects you. That keeps me from saying, nah, we won't go there. We won't go that high. You know, you didn't do your numbers. Or you didn't talk to me on the front end about what you wanted to do, how much cash you had available to work with, and worked backwards into the deal. Next slide. So 80% of acquisition, or 65 to 70% of after renovation value, whichever is less, typically. So, you have a property that you say is worth 235,000 after it's renovated. How do you know? You talk to some good people. You got good information. That's how you know. You didn't pull the number out of the air. I'm not gonna pull the number out of the air. I'm gonna use appraisals that you're gonna pay for, or somebody's gonna pay for. I'm going to talk to a lot of the same people that are in this room that you should have talked to before I'm talking to them. Because it's going to be the lesser of 80% of acquisition or 65% of ARV. Um, your acquisition, next slide. And that's just question mark. The bouncing question mark is just highlighting how do you know what your after renovation value is. And that's just research. So, 65% of 235 ARV is only 152.750. That's the loan amount cap that most private equity lenders would lend in this scenario. By these numbers, you would need $47,250 cash for hard costs in this property investment. Because in this case, 65% was less than 80%. Okay? Next slide. Okay. Those are your hard costs. But wait, there's more. There's the soft costs. When you did your research and you first talked to those hard money guys and you saw the shark fins, the closing costs and interest expense are substantial in private equity lending based on the same market and transactional risks that you're experiencing. So typical soft costs, things to remember. These are your baseline loan and closing costs. You're gonna pay between two to five points. One point's 1% 1 of the loan amount. About 5% for title transfer tax, state stamps, and lender fees. You gotta be careful. You know, some of these lenders, they'll charge the percent plus the points, and then they have a $995 underwriting fee, and then they have a $600 
uh, you know, review fee, and then they have a $250 delivery fee. Well, if you're buying a $65,000 property and you're paying a $995 underwriting fee, that's more than an extra point. Again, do your research, get your facts, call me, I'll walk through a deal with you to see if it basically makes sense. Okay? <laughs> Don't forget your property taxes and insurance. Um, this end of lending, a lot of people say, ah, we don't ask for it. You have to pay those taxes yourself. So you don't have to bring all that money to the table like you would on an A paper agency deal. 12 months taxes in advance for an investor. No problem. But you know what? The state wants their money, the county wants their money. If you settle in September, you're going to bring six months or 12 months to the table. So even though you're not giving it to the lender, the property taxes and insurance are an expense. So you add all this up and you got 10 to 15 percent in soft costs on top of the hard costs. Don't, don't sweat it. No worries. They're simply part of your cost analysis. And there's some good news. Most, well, many private equity lenders will allow you to add the points or the closing costs to the acquisition costs just like carpet or a countertop. They'll add that in, ask questions. The worst they can do is say no. And that makes a big difference because what are you doing if the lenders add it to the acquisition cost? OPM, other people's money. Build it into your costs and that may make all the difference. Next slide. So, just like Gordon would say, Measure twice, cut once, rerun your LTV, your ARV numbers after you've gotten your title costs, after you've talked to your lender, after you have the mechanics of the deal down, rerun those costs so you can see where you are. As many lenders as there probably are in this room, there's two times that number of options to structure a private equity loan transaction. Get with a lender. Get with a couple of lenders. Flush the deals out so you can see what the numbers look like on this theory you have about buying your first or second property or your 50th property. Your lender is your partner, particularly in hard money and private equity because they've got to satisfy investors. Most of these guys are working with hedge funds or private, private money. Uh, they don't have a big bank protecting them. They're not on salary. They want the deal to work. And they are your partners. It's a different relationship than it is with a paper. And of course, most of all, use your resources here. Use your PWI meetup resources. Hit all four and you're in the door on these baselines. Let's review. 80% of acquisition or 65% of ARV. Calculate your hard and your soft costs accurately. Be conservative. Talk to your lender about your plan. What do you want to do? 443, 336, 7000. Hey, Joe. It's George. This is what I'm thinking. Text me back. That's how it starts. If you're not sure, JV with somebody here in the room, partner with someone. Uh, one of the coaches, and just feel good about what you're doing. Let them fuel you. Let them give you some motivation. You, <laughs> you can't do this alone. You, and, and to be honest with you, it's not fun doing it alone. The fun in this is, is the guy sitting right next to you, the girl sitting right next to you, because the relationships and the success that we share together is a lot more fun I mean, it sounds crazy, but it, it really is a lot more fun than the money you're going to make. Because you'll meet some people that you just, I, I mean, I, I can tell stories just from the people I've met here. That you just, it's people that you think, there's no way that guy could be successful. And you find out, you know, the following meetup, he's a millionaire. And he's wearing a t-shirt and boots and he's got drywall dust all over him. How can that guy be a millionaire? I, I wore a tie for 30 years and I'm not a millionaire. So, it's a great group. Um, get involved, and uh, I think you'll be successful. So, uh, thank you. That's my information again.
uh, website, email, and my favorite, which is text or cell phone. Any questions? Dan, do you want a field or where is it? Right behind you. Oh, okay. You have a. Oh. Okay, yeah, we're going to open the floor up for QA for anyone here, any of the panelists. But, yeah, just try to find your way to you, uh, Len, uh, everywhere. Yeah, on, on, my, on private equity and the hard money, uh, it's pretty much nationwide. I mean, some of the, some of the um, <laughs> local hard money guys are. Um, you know, Baltimore, <coughs> mid Maryland, um, you know, DC. Uh, but most of the hedge fund backed money is nationwide. Um, and then everything in between. You know, some lenders only lend in certain states. Uh, but obviously, if we're talking about that lender, they lend in Maryland. Um, but that's a good question because you want to ask. You know, I, I get those calls and I forget to clarify, and it's not until the end of the conversation that they tell me it's in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, and we've just spent five minutes analyzing a deal with a particular lender that doesn't lend in New Jersey. So, you know, if you're not down the street, remind me. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions? I have a question for Gordon. Uh, so, so you mentioned you fire architects and uh, fire your, your projects. Yes. Do you think there is some, so if I buy, I buy houses, like cheaper houses, like 100,000, like selling for 200, let's say flips, do you still think it's kind of viable or like it makes sense to you know, this type of expense, like hire an architect? If you can get the permits you need to do what you want to do without an architect, then it's not necessary. However, I can't do any of my projects to, to the level that I'm rehabbing without one. I'm making just dramatic changes in the building. Um, structural things that I can't just sign my name to and say, hey, Gordon promises. I need somebody with a license and an insurance policy, right, that they're put on the line um, and when they when they sign the drawing. Um, but no, if you, if you're, if, if I was doing a county house, for example, like, and I was just, it was simply paint and carpet, let's call it that, hey, that's very few and far between, let's say paint and carpet. No, I mean, you, you don't need an architect for that. You just need somebody that can pull the permits for Plumbing, electrical, APAC, things like that. Okay, thank you. Yep. Sir. Uh, can you recommend an architect? You recommend an architect? Yeah, I work with a gentleman named Justin Sito. Um, if you let me be a little bit rude and scroll through my phone, I will give you his number. I'm sure he won't mind. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Justin, last name spelled S-E-T-O, phone number 410-935-2612. And uh, I just looked at two properties with him yesterday, you know, two houses I just bought. So he's, he's out there and he's available. Anyone else? Bring it up, bring it up. Hey, to the first uh, speaker, uh, what, is, what is your um, formula for uh, uh, deciding what you're going to pay for a house? Uh, well, it depends. I mean, certain areas, like I know the back, like the back of my hand, right? For example, I mean, not that this probably means anything to anybody here, but. <clears throat> um, well, here's a good example. A student of mine, uh, you know, emailed me about a property, and I know one. I knew the block that it was, you know, it was funky. I know in West Philadelphia, for example, there's like four zip codes, right? One nine one three nine, one nine three one, one one nine one three one, zero oh, four, and uh, five one, right? And one nine one three nine, I don't, I don't do anything over ten thousand dollars. It's a buy and hold area generally, so there's really no rehabbing going on. You know, between five and ten. Ten is, is you know, the most I'm willing to do. Just be, and also, I know the house values really aren't. There's a lot of different things. The, the, you know, the block, 
But, you know, a hard and fast rule for me is no more than 10 in that area. Now, like the example that I gave, the case study, it's, it's kind of hard for me to say. But, I mean, you know, some, some wholesalers have a formula. Like they'll say they start at 80% and then they <coughs> deduct, uh, you know, rehab at cost. No, I don't do all that. Or some people just do 50%. That. You don't I have don't, a formula, no, basically. I don't do all that. Okay. I, I mean, like I said earlier, you know, the easiest, fastest way is to see what other investors are paying for cash yeah. in an area. Okay. And you'll begin to see, you know, like for example, this that particular area that I just told you about, West Philadelphia, you know, roughly I know in this price, you know, between these, you know, this price point and that price point, what's going to sell? You know, sometimes we overcome. I'm not suggesting no, this. No, so you do that by, by going, going into the MLS space. Right. Okay. I mean, I and even before I had MLS access, I used, I hate to say it, Zillow. But there's a way to really use Zillow. You want to look at what the sold, you know, it's like the sec, I haven't used it in a very long time. But you had the, what was actively being marketed, right? And then you had below that what had sold in that area. So you click those for those people who do not have MLS access. You can use to rely on that, and you can get a kind of rough idea of what. And you, you know, you. I don't know Baltimore, Baltimore County, wherever people are investing, but you know what is, you know, what a discount property looks like, right? So I know what a discount looks like somewhere. If it's one, is you see a bunch of tens, fifteens, twenties, and then you see ninety, eighty. You know, a hundred thousand. Then you know these numbers here, pretty much like what investors are buying. They're cash deals, so that tells you. Wow. Do you have a uh, tax record? Do you have access to the tax record and everything? Yeah. Okay. Right. So I also look at that. Gordon asked the question. And he asked the tax records. So, you know, I, you know, those are things I look at too before I return a phone call. You know, are there any back property taxes? You know, I, it's, I could spend all day just in answering that one. Yeah, I know. But, so, <laughs> but, you know, generally. So somebody else had a question. Right here, know. gentlemen from the yellow. Hi, Yvonne. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm from Philadelphia, so I know okay. the zip you're talking about. <laughs> right. I used to live at 3 1. So. Okay. Um, my question is because you, you mentioned during your talk about uh, looking at cash buyers. So, how do you separate um, cash buyer activity? like fake cash buyers, like the speculative sucker properties that trade that never get fixed mm -hmm. from ones that are actually like real activity that, you know, there's value creation. How do you separate the two? Because I also, I've been down in the DC area and there's one neighborhood, some people may know like Trinidad for the longest was kind of a trading kind of area. Now it's kind of hot, but properties is always traded, but no one ever really fixed it. Like, it was almost like if you're familiar with the tulip market, how uh, they became so speculative. Um, how do you separate um, speculation for speculation's sake versus actual value creation from the, when you're looking at cash deals? Um, I actually, I'm really not sure what you're asking me in so, terms of, you know, whether somebody's buying a property and they're just, they're just buying it and just letting it sit. Right, so or, buys one for 10 buying and it. sells it to someone for 15 and you just see, but no one actually ever fixes them. They just right. keep trading, so. I don't, well, I personally, I really don't care. But, I mean, I just, you understand like what I'm saying? Like you don't get caught in like a sucker buy versus like like something like Dorrance, you know this area is changing right. versus something that I mean, everyone thinks is transitional, but it's not really transitional. Well, trust me, it is transitional. I mean, I, I'm just, yeah. I don't mean to say it, like, you know, sound like that, but it is. I mean, if you do the research, I mean, I research. There's New Bold, mm -hmm. which is a section inside of Point Breeze, which is all, as you know, it's just South Philly. There's four zip codes, four, five, six, seven, eight. So, you know, important you got that. So, I mean, I know that who I'm dealing with are actual people who are investors who are buying to rehab property. Now, I can't, I can't really speak for, you know, other purchases. I don't know if I'm answering your question, 
Yeah, because sometimes with new, new real estate, because I'm, I'm an agent too, sometimes right. new, people hear about areas that are hot, so right. people jump in, and everyone's like herd mentality jumping to an area, right. but it's not really hot. Well, I don't know, for example, I mean, I, I've, I've done research, like for example, I became familiar with Newbold by way of a buyer, I didn't even know, you know, I'm like, where the hell is Newbold, right? So I then did my research, right? And then people, you know, well, I don't know, my buyers say to me, this is where I'm, where I'm looking to buy. I know they're, first of all, if you're new to wholesaling, right? So, you know, you want to vet your people. That's another one, right? For example, you know, this is what I learned is that, hey, I've never done business with you, and this is what I require. I require proof of funds. Do you really have the ability to close? Like, you're not just somebody, you know, who went to a seminar and, you know, got a course and you're parroting what you're, what you're reading off out of, out of the book. So, you know, I, I require that from people that I've never done business with. So, you know, I'm sure there's a way to fake it, but, you know, if you're serious, people who are serious about buying, they're not going to have a problem with um, furnishing that information to you. So, I don't know if they kind of like, I went left field with that, but, um, but you know, you, you, you got to do your due diligence, you know, so. But trust and believe, Point Breeze is very hot and new bold. So. Yeah, I grew up in 4-7, so. Okay, yeah. so. And it's very hot right now. Right. Right. Queen Yeah, you buy anything in, those, in any of those zip codes, right? So, but anyway, hopefully that answers your question. Paula? Question for Gordon. So in all the rehabs you've done, like mm -hmm. you give us two or three examples of total nightmares, <laughs> things yeah. gone wrong that you've learned from and that we can learn from. Well, so one question. Yeah, that is a good question. Um, one thing would be, and I covered it in the, my initial presentation, was waterproof your basement because I've, in my pre-waterproofing life. <laughs> Finished the basement and it got wet and then I had to tear out lots of beautiful work to properly waterproof the basement and then remarket the property. That would be, that's, you know, just from a kind of, you know, 100% on my shoulders sort of thing, uh, probably the, the worst. Um, next thing would be how I dealt with, with other parties, you know. Um, a rehab, from start to finish, you know, it just has so many people, and there's people, and there's, you know, physical things, but there's just so many people, and it's, there's really a lot of opportunities for things to go awry, and um, so given the specifics, it would, it would definitely be related to my dealing with contractors and lessons learned, um, probably firing somebody when he still owed me work and I had paid him too much money, just to show them how smart I am, right? That, that's high on the list of things I definitely shouldn't have done that I wouldn't do anymore. Um, and I've, I, and then I've, one thing that can't be ignored it would be, I, these two I think kind of go hand in hand. One is um, overpaying for a house and it's because you didn't start with a realistic budget. I used to do that all the time. I would try to force a deal because I felt like I needed to be Donald Trump not related to the presidential, but like from a, you know, a real estate perspective, I need to grab everything, so I would try to justify every deal I could. Oh, I can squeeze a few pennies here. Oh, I don't need to replace that. that that's, a, that's a recipe to do a lot of work and then make 10 grand at the end of your rehab, which might sound like a lot of money to some people, but when you've worked on a project for between three and four months, um, $10,000, you could have made that working um, pretty much anywhere else. So, um, I hope that's some, some good feedback. But, yeah. Just Maybe? follow up to that. How, how do you get your, you were talking about uh, having the plumbers and the electrician stuff working together. But they have separate contracts. So how do you establish relationships where you get them to commit to doing that side-by-side -side work to make things better in the interior? <coughs> Well, I wouldn't work or with them. If they, I wouldn't work with them if they didn't. You know, for my my general belief is the contracts don't mean anything in real estate. Um, just because unless you're willing to take somebody to court, 
really doesn't mean like, am I really going to sue? You're going to sue me if I don't buy your house? Probably, probably not. I mean, you might, but you know, <laughs> right? You know what I'm saying? Right. You're probably going to do what's easier, which would be to sell to somebody else. So, right. and then that's kind of with, with uh, when you're talking about contractors as well, it's mutual best interest. Um, I provide them with a lot of work, and I require that they work together. Now, the the plumber that I'm working with referred to me the HVAC guy that I've been working with now. Um, so those two are their buddies on the job, basically. And my electrician, he can work around anybody. Um, he's just that kind of guy. Um, what I've learned is it's worth spending a little bit more money to work with these people than it is to save money and deal with headaches. Um, because ultimately, you're not really saving money. Question in the back? <clears throat> I can't read your name tag from here, I'm sorry. James Gagnon, uh, GPI Hummocks, first, first uh, time here. I, I had a question, I don't know if you the maybe you got the answer, you know, with the importance of getting those uh, estimates right, or not estimates, you want to be exact, uh, you really need access to the MLS. Is there, uh, I've heard that some people can partner or get a relationship with realtors and get access to the MLS. I don't have that right now, so I'm just looking for that step, you know, I mean, people laugh about Zillow, you know, so, so um, how do you get those, uh, get that access? To that, uh, Is your question, could you repeat the question? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking for a way to get access to the MLS to really get better information on the property. For yourself personally? Right, yeah, for my, for my business. I got three right. departments, so I'm looking for I mean, I don't have any really, uh, And In Maryland, should I? Uh, oh, in, in Maryland, I mean, there's opportunities. There's multiple ways to get access to the MLS. Um, you can become the assistant to an agent okay. so very quickly. That's my access. And there you go. So you I'm just pull an agent and tell me she was going to tell you. That's the access that I have. Okay. Okay. I'm married to an agent. You don't have to do that. Uh, <laughs> how's that work out? <laughs> so, yeah, that, that's. Uh, but I know um, I don't know about here, but in Pennsylvania, they're getting really strict with that. I just happen to be fortunate that the guy that I, we do a lot of business together, so, and he granted that to me, so. Ma'am? I'm typically at the top of the neighborhood market. Yeah, um, I don't always try to, I mean, there's some neighborhoods where I've like pushed the comps and I, like the first time I bought a house in Hamden and rehabbed it, I sold it for 225. I spent three or four years rehabbing there and I sold my last one for 375. So now it's not the same house, but still, like I, I push that market. And that's, you know, that, I, I do that pretty much anywhere that I'm working. I'm looking to, you know, get as much as possible. Um, that being said, I have a strategy that is not just what am I going to price it today. I'm looking at what do I, what is my realistic expectation out of this house, and how do I get there? How can I get to that expectation? Does that mean that I price high and give it to, let it sit two weeks, and then maybe drop the price ten thousand dollars because you know anything less than a ten thousand dollar price reduction is meaningless at that price point? Um, there's a lot of times that I'll do that. Um, sometimes it's the time of the year Well, I'll just look at the price if necessary because I really don't think a lack of showings is indicative of my house you know, reflecting poorly or being overpriced. It could be Christmas, it could be anything. So I mean, um, I'm, not, I'm trying to answer your question directly, but I always shoot, I'm always shooting for top dollar, but I never lose sight of well, what would be acceptable for me and how can I get there. And, and that all plays back into the negotiation strategy as well. So, does that, does that answer your question? Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, I have a question for Gordon also. Um, how, um, I guess, how, how cost effective is it to, like, say, if you purchase a property for maybe like 65000 uh, after we have uh, value is maybe about 120, 125. How, how cost effective is it 
to have like someone like yourself go in and like do a total demo and rehab? Yeah, and so one thing I didn't really get into in my presentation that's tremendously important was actually maybe indirectly but covered very well by Mike Green last month. Um, it's really about what you do in your business. And it goes back to the gentleman who asked me that question about the architect. And, um, I wouldn't do that deal. I wouldn't do it. Um, my deal, if I'm buying it for 60, I'm probably shooting to sell it for 220. Like that's just kind of where I'm, just off the top of my head probably. I'm, now, where somebody else says they're putting 60 into a house, I don't know if it's true. I'm typically somewhere between 85 and 100. And I'll, and, I, there's no shame. That's how I run my business. So um, I, could, I wouldn't be able to help you with a house like that. I would. Um, I think that depending on what your goals are, if you're trying to rehab and resell, I would tell you that you're probably in the wrong neighborhood. Good point. Thank you. Another. Well, She's looking for money. <laughs> <laughs> looking for money. <laughs> Where do you find money for? Rehab. Oh, yeah, for <laughs> um, Alright, so there's a. Uh, yeah, no, I hear you. Definitely. Um, I paid high prices for money before, particularly when I was first getting started. Um, if I had to do all over again, partners are a really good, really good thing. The right partner, and not a general partner that you're with forever. A partner that you can partner with on a deal by deal basis. There was a two young men that came through here today and mentioned that they kind of operate their business that way. So, getting started, that might be how I would have done it if I had it to do over again. Um, there's what people call hard money lenders, and then some people want to call them private lenders. Um, in my opinion, the uh, the only difference between the two is that the hard money lender knows what his money's worth. Um, he's probably somewhat in the real estate business. The private money lender, who is typically the people that I work with now, um, they're just happy that I'm paying them a good rate of return, and it's not sitting in their IRA or their bank account. Um, but you're not going to get that until you prove yourself. So there is another. There's, that's a whole spectrum, right? We covered the expensive guy and we covered the, lead, the less expensive person. There is the money, there, there's lenders in the Baltimore market that if everybody else is at, let's say, five and 15, right? Five points and 15%, they live at three and 13 and they keep their money on the street. That's who I would be looking for if I were you. I would be looking for the person that is always fully invested. They're not necessarily trying to get 20%, they're happy to make that 16%, right? I'm adding the points in that. Yeah. Interest, right? So um, that lender exists. So if I were you, I'd be looking at partners. I'd be look, I'd be looking for that lender. And if, but don't ever, if, if you have a good deal, the money is there. If if the money's not there, then you don't have a good deal. So, another way of saying the same thing. So this is for Gordon and Joe. I for the first. So private equity. What what are you people looking for? for return on money. What what are the you folks. You, you, the that oh, 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 eight to ten percent. Okay. Yeah. And Joe, you talked no about point. everything but the percentage. You sort of dodged at the beginning of your slideshow talking about points, which you didn't talk about. Points, 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 points. Percentages? It, it depends on the range. It really does. Um, you know, tonight we kind of focused on private equity, hard money, and I agree with Gordon. You're you're somewhere north of eight um, percent, uh, and also. To follow up on what Gordon said, most of the hedge fund guys and the private guys, they want to keep the money on the street. Um, and they're big on track record. Uh, I, I, I've led to people, you know, at 13 and 3, and then a year later the same lender is lending to them at 10 and 1. Because they like that particular investor style, they like the success of the projects that they've had. Um, you know, there's there's lines, capital working lines of credit out there now, so you get a good relationship with some of these hedge fund lenders, and they'll let you draw on a line. And the, the price of the line will go down as you use them and are successful with that. Right. You both mentioned um, 
keep the money on the street. I'm looking to build up a rental portfolio. So where I'm paying that principal and interest over an extended period of time. Is that what you mean by keeping the money on the street? Or are they looking to get the return off of the flip and then put it back out and return? Most of them are looking short term. Now, buy and hold is a different set of investors. Uh, it's a different type of money. Uh, it's a different risk analysis. Um, you know, and, and there's a lot of buy and hold investors that can buy agency finance, four and a half, five percent today with a point or two. That's a great buy and hold carry. But you got to meet those guidelines. You're not going to be able to include renovation on, on most of the A paper stuff that's out there, particularly as an investor. Um, you know, you may partner with a buyer and do two or three K. Some of the local banks will do uh, some things that are a little bit outside the